many of you woke up this morning and thought, today I'm going to leave everything I've ever known, my home, my friends, my family, my whole world. I'm going to go miles and miles away to places that exist only in my dreams. I may cross oceans. I don't know where I'm going to live. I will have very little or no money or clothes. I may starve. I may be attacked, even sold or die. Too many people have to. I did not. But life can change in just today. August 7th, 1972, that decision was made for me and my family. Then President Idi Amin of Uganda declared South Asians could no longer live in Uganda. South Asians had been migrating into parts of Africa since the early 1900s. My father, like many others, migrated from India to Uganda in 1929. Most of us were born there. We were citizens. Regardless, Idi Amin said, you have 90 days to leave or else. An estimated 65,000 South Asians needed valid travel documents. There was one immigration office in the whole country. The employees were neither prepared nor willing to accommodate that kind of paperwork. Long lines lasted for days into nights into weeks. I had broken my glasses. I needed to go to the city to an optician. Usually a day trip, I would be back home that night. On the 80 mile road, we were stopped eight times. Frisked and questioned by soldiers with guns, Uzis, machetes. In daylight, we managed. Nighttime presented huge risks. I never got to go back home. I stayed in Kampala for, for a while, and then went to Nairobi, Kenya, and then on to the UK, a couple of places. Eventually, got to Toronto and settled there as a refugee. This journey took months. I traveled alone. I was 14 at the time. My parents and 10 siblings were scattered around nine countries. I was not reunited with my parents for almost a year and a half until they too could finally come to Canada. Since the exodus, the first time that we were ever able or could come together as a family was several years later at my wedding. One of my sisters was a refugee in Belgium. She lived in the Flemish-speaking part of Antwerp. Due to a language barrier, and a medical misdiagnosis. She passed away a couple of months before our wedding. Many of you may have experienced or heard stories about immigrants from your parents, your forefathers, your friends. Many have seen the indelible images of little Alan Cordy, the three-year-old boy from Syria on that Turkish beach. I couldn't put up those images there. The horror hits too close to home. 
Immigration is often born of dire situations. Desperation causing good people to seek a better life of hope, of safety, for a better education, prosperity. I was lucky to escape the ravages of a brutal regime. I did whatever jobs I could, babysitting, dishwashing, waitressing, tutoring, so I could support myself and pay for my education. Back then, not too many people even knew where Uganda was. Many thought Africa was a country. I was even asked, did you live like Tarzan? Did you have lions for pets? I have to admit, I finally said yes. It's so much fun cuddling lions. <laughs> there was no Google then. 1973, the year Sergey Brin was born. Six years later, he migrated to the US to escape Jewish persecution. And now we all have Google, an immigrant's gift. I endured a lot of name calling, things thrown at me, teased about my clothes. I didn't have proper shoes, so I fell in my first snow. Had a broken wrist my first day of school. My siblings, who were very well educated, would go out looking for jobs, only to be turned down because they were overqualified. Our social hangout was at a community college where they allowed us to play badminton for free. And many teenagers came and got together there. And that's where I met my husband, also an immigrant from Kenya. The grind of working long hours, low pay, not seeing my newborn daughter for more than one to two hours a day prompted us to seek better opportunities. So we migrated from Canada to the US, seek the American dream. My journey forced me to become independent very quickly. I was now raising two daughters. My own life as a teenager was focused on survival. I had no idea how to raise teenage daughters in America. What a culture shock. It's very different and very difficult. I took every opportunity to learn new skills got involved in my girls' schools, did a lot of community service. I went back and forth working part-time, and in my later years, went back to school to finish my higher education, and then went back to work full-time. Because of my extensive volunteer service experience, the dean of the School of Biomedical Engineering at Drexel University had appointed me to direct a program we named We Serve. I taught students about service learning and prepared them for opportunities to serve in rural areas in Mozambique and the Gambia. These amazing students wanted to bring their skills to serve abroad. I felt very strongly that before they venture out into rural villages such as one I had lived in as a child, that it was important for them to learn to apply their skills to the needs in their own backyard, the Drexel neighborhood. And I believed experience would be their best teacher. So, I challenged them to live on $2 a day. By the way, almost half the world's population still lives on less than $2 a day. 
About 30 students rose to this challenge. They had to build and live in shelters. They had very limited running water. They could not have their friends provide food for them if they were hungry. They had to ask strangers or make do without. I was right there with them taking this challenge, sleeping on the wet grass in that cardboard shelter. One night, some students had been partying too much. They came by and started kicking down our shelter. They didn't realize we were sleeping in there. We came out and we asked them to stop. They just laughed and continued and knocked it down. We were exposed to the elements. None of us could sleep. Although I had obtained permission from Drexel security, that morning, someone came out and said, you can't live here anymore. You have to vacate. Students had to go to their classes. I didn't allow them to skip classes during the challenge. So they were scattered over three campuses. I also didn't allow them cell phones during this challenge. So they had no idea how or where we would meet again or where we would sleep that night. In our group reflections later, I said to them, this is exactly how it was for me when I was kicked out of Uganda separated from my parents for almost 18 months without any communication or hardly any communication. This experience gave the students a great sense of awareness. The power of a community, bonds being formed among students of diverse backgrounds from interdisciplinary areas of the university who had never met before until they shared this experience and who still stay connected after all these years. I share this with you to think about the courage of those students to explore and learn about the differences in people's lives, different cultures, disparities in communities, assessing those needs, not to impose one's standards on someone else. It was a profound and moving experience for the students. In retrospect, what I learned was that while I thought I was teaching my students about service and different cultures, and I believe I did, it was I who found healing through reliving this experience of homelessness, which I had never truly recovered from. I was fortunate. I wasn't taken advantage of when I was 14 and traveling alone, reliant on others. Despite what some would have otherwise, it was the goodwill of people around me who enabled me to advance and realize the dream of American citizenship. America's Pride is its democracy and pluralism. Multitudes of immigrant communities who have come here for centuries to America have enabled this. Many came by choice. Many, like myself, were forced to leave. Migration is inevitable. It has gone on for centuries. It will continue. It has to continue for us to progress. 
the dream of the pursuit of the American dream remains strong for so many. We are intellectual beings. We strive to progress. We're constantly seeking ways to better ourselves. And whether we move from rural areas or villages into towns, towns into cities, developing countries to America, my forefathers migrated from India to Uganda. We migrated to North America. My daughters migrated, one to Argentina, the other to the UK. My granddaughter, who is not even five, is fascinated by outer space and wants to know how she can live there. <laughs> Migration will continue with every generation, everywhere. Whether by force, or by necessity, or by choice, there is nothing more powerful than the work ethic of an immigrant driven by dreams. We have all benefited from this, and we have all contributed to that. Why stop? Thank you.